Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me get my slides up. I really like to thank the organizers for inviting us because what I'll be talking about is not really fun in that sense. Uh, uh, my my panel is here, my research panel, and uh, we very grateful that we are invited because when you think of games and you talk about aggression and the evil and all that uh, things, it's almost like taboo and uh, expecting some rotten eggs to be thrown, that kind of thing, okay? Because game when I say gamers are aggressive, uh, straight away you say, I've been a gamer for so long and I'm not aggressive. And uh, we, we hope to provide a balance of the research, the good and the bad. And seriously, I mean, if you want to get, uh, get teachers interested in serious games, you've got to change their mindsets and you've got to uh, take away the st negative stereotype away from that. I, I know that because when I go to class and I see a group of young teachers, trainee teachers, and I ask them, how many of you play games? And the typical reply is this, I'm a teacher now, I, I have stopped playing games. It's as though you know, if you, a teacher who plays games is, you know, is not congruent with your role as an educator. You cannot corrupt the minds of the young by playing a game in the classroom. It seems to be like that. And I, I, I also see teachers who, when, when I talk about games, they say, oh yeah, that's very bad because I have students who skip games, they play truant, they are seriously addicted, you know, they don't care about the schoolwork, and they stay in the room all the time, and the parents are at, at odds what to do. Now, all these issues will be addressed by my colleagues later on. I have the easy part. I just show some slides and talk about the moral part, not the research results yet. So, okay. Let me just go quickly through the research. Um, firstly, as you can see here, um, th this is something that has been well researched and is very controversial because there are people out there who would slam our papers and say we are writing nonsense, we are hysterical, right? But there, there is evidence showing that uh, indeed uh, those who play violent games can become more aggressive. Here it shows that you know, if you think about the games long enough, right, you can become more aggressive. I think the timer is on for the PowerPoint. It's just the slides are moving, moving on its own. Okay, there. I have to. Thanks, Mary. Can you help me turn it off? Thanks. While well, I go on talk, talking about this, yeah, the timing is yeah so, uh, is on. I don't want the timer to be on because that's what uh, yeah. Okay, so th there is enough. Uh, there is a body of research to show that players who play violent games can get aggressive. Now, don't get mixed up. They don't get violent. They get aggressive. And of, of those, those of you who play games have seen enough four-letter words when you don't do well. I play World of Warcraft, and I, I also play Guild Wars too. now. My guild leader is in the audience. And uh, from time to time, when you, you don't heal properly, and somebody dies, and I play healer, some four-letter words will appear. Right. So I want to retaliate. I'll, I'll tell you more about that. I, get, I do get more aggressive. I don't get violent. Okay? So don't get the two mixed up. So here is one slide to show ag aggression. Uh, desensitization to aggression. This is not another piece of research that is publicized here. That they become respon less responsive to violence. Uh, it's still moving. So I guess I have to move along with the, with the slides, the, t the timing of the slides. So there is some research here on hostility, aggressive uh, intentions, poor perspective taking, and, uh, in, and the lesser ability to, to sympathize with people. Okay, so these are the research results. Uh, okay, right. Uh, no, no timing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, continue from here. So there, there's a lot of, it's very wordy, I don't intend you to read every word, but just to show you that there's enough research on that. And we, we've got to take these concerns seriously. If you want to, more teachers, more people to play games, you've got to change the mindset and you've got to take these concerns seriously. There's also addiction, which one of my colleagues will address later on, okay? So you cannot say, oh, they are just overreacting. So as I said, do not confuse aggression with violence. Uh, I want to show you some very violent games, the top five last year. This is to wake you up after lunch. Can <laughs> move towards here just later? Mo mo I move it forward. At number three, 
has got to be the god of war. Apologize if after lunch you feel queasy after watching this. Kratos is nuts and his anger just doesn't seem to diminish. The boss battles are insanely epic with extreme levels of awesome brutality. Awesome if brutality ever there was a, is a character selling that point. couldn't be stopped, it's Kratos. Nothing, I repeat absolutely nothing, will stop this guy getting to Zeus. At number two. Just number one. <laughs> All right. Uh, so when parents see this kind of game, they search for games that is really concerned. They don't want their kids to play that. And I don't think wives would like husbands to play this, even though they are meant for adults. I'll be seriously worried if my husband is playing all these games, okay? Uh, there are more edifying games out in the market. And why? There are growing concerns because, as you see from here, children ages two to five are playing, in fact, younger than five. Those of you who have toddlers, you know the favorite toy is not the soft toy. The favorite toy is your iPad or your iPhone, right? So there, is, there are serious concerns here. And now to set the balance straight, okay, I was just showing all those violence. There are also the good things about games. There are cognitive benefits of games, right? They improve your skills and later on some people were talking about the medical benefits of games. And my, my, my friend Daniel will talk about it on, on Saturday morning, right? The cognitive benefits and the calming effects of relaxing video games. So there are good games out there too. So I do tell parents, I do give talks to parents and show them the bad and I say, hey, that's not the all. That you are right to get worried, but you must also focus on the good. All right. Uh, yeah, creativity as well. I think educators will be interested in this creativity. And recently, you know, uh, with a focus on a character education in MOE, I'm delighted to really see character education because we are trying to shift the, the paranoia of uh, exams, you know, and all this overemphasis on academic subjects to character education. Can video games act as moral educators, especially the violent and aggressive ones? I took this slide from uh, Lee Sheldon. He is a teacher of game design in Indiana, and I like it very much because here you have an orc in the classroom. And as when I looked at it, I said, if I imagine a teacher going to class one day, dressed an, as an orc, and say, today we are going to learn the mathematics of WOW and to teach you, you know, uh, the maths through World of Warcraft, can you imagine the excitement in the class? Right? I mean, but, but then I, I don't think I can find teachers who would dress up as orcs and walking around and, you know, in the classroom and exciting the teachers. I wish that could, that could happen. Okay, uh, somebody wrote this, John Nollinger, and he's saying that you know, uh, games like World of Warcraft can teach philosophy, World of Warcraft and philosophy, right? He's, he's, that's his book, uh, Wrath of the Philosopher King. I like the title a lot. Right, so he gives a detailed example. Let me read this one now. When young teenage males are in a raid, they often act either condescending, and you're quite familiar with that, right? Or overzealous, for instance, a tank. For those of you who don't know what a tank is, that's the character you play with, you take a lot of damage. Rushing into a dangerous crowd without regard for his teammates or a mage. Lecturing a healer for not responding that quickly enough. Through empathy or playing a few alts, and you, sometimes you play the tank, sometimes you play the healer, you, you, alts are the alternative characters. You often get to see literally what wearing another's shoes provides. You don't have to imagine. You actually are in that person's shoes when you switch roles, right? Uh, a tank with healer out is often more patient. A mage that also has tank can often appreciate the challenge of holding aggro. Simple lesson to see things from another perspective. So if you want to teach perspective taking, what do you do? You can use a game like that. Okay, this is Nick Yi's uh, quote. I like this a lot because um, a lot of people think that if you stay in a virtual world for too long, you get so immersed in your game identity that you lose sense of real life. And parents get worried and they say, what if my kids get so en engrossed in the game and they forget about the real life responsibility? That can happen. And they forget that, that they merge that what's real and what's virtual. Well, I'm going to show the next few slides on what is virtual and what is real. And this is important because if you're going to learn anything, the virtual has to be regarded as real and very real and pertinent and salient to us. Okay, so Nick Yi says, you know, this is a wedding in WoW. For those of you who play WoW, you know they are familiar with this, right? Um, he says they are parallel worlds. They are not unreal. When you think of virtual, you think of virtual as being opposite to real. What is real, what's unreal, what's real, what's virtual, so therefore virtual is unreal. But he's saying that virtual is real. There are, there are parallel worlds where these things take place, cultures, economies, societies, right? Um, 
people get married, people propose to each other in WoW as well. Okay, in, some people meet in the game world as well. So yeah, so it's real. And two very renowned uh, game researchers, John uh, Thomas and Doug Thomas and John C. Lee Brown, uh, they say that the idea of virtual and real as two separate things is actually not quite accurate. They are both through conceptual blending, they are both one and the same time, both and together. These are, these are some of the things they say. Virtual worlds provide opportunity for participants to be both and inside and outside, player and avatar at the same time. You are coexisting in the same space, character and person, your avatar and person at the same time. It's not switching from real to, to unreal. So that's, that's why the virtual world is real. So that's an imaginative bridge between the two, they say. And then uh, he, they go on to say relationships among players outside the game is transformed by the events inside the game. And that's what we like to see. What happens outside the game is transformed. What, what happens in the game too? So there is a, is a blending and a merging of the two. Okay, so it's not just learning to play the game, but what's exciting when you play these kind of games, you're also learning to be. And hopefully, you're not learning to be more aggressive or more addicted. Hopefully, you're learning to be more, uh, a better, more moral person. This just came out very new. I got it just two days ago. Somebody did this research of uh, mirrored mor uh, titled Mirrored Morality, Exploration of Moral Choice in Video Games. It's very wordy, so I've highlighted those uh, orange words, but it's, it doesn't show up on the slides here. It shows up better on my, my screen. So I'm going to read out the orange words. The majority of players made moral decisions and behaved towards non-player game characters. These are the NPCs, non-player characters as if these were actual personal, interpersonal interaction. So if I kill an NPC, say, you know, NPC is not real. But actually, the killing is the process of an interacting with is real to me. And sometimes, in my experience, and I, there's other research papers to show that when I kill, I have to engage in moral disengagement. In other words, I have to tell myself, this is only a game, it's only a game, keep killing, doesn't matter, it's only a game. Because it makes me uncomfortable. I, am, I, I have identified my, my avatar, I have identified with the NPC so much, and this research shows that. So behaving in an antisocial way did increase guilt, but had no impact on enjoyment. You still enjoy, but you know, you still enjoy, but you still have the guilt element. And when you play those very violent games, you've got to disassociate with that. And they say every indication in this study is that the majority of players have strong moral presence within the game environment and do not make decisions as though it's just a game. So that's good news as well for game developers. You know, the, the, your players, you know that the players, you know, make it's for a good game, the players will be so immersed that the, I, their characters are part of themselves, an extension of their actual or perhaps even their ideal selves. So I'm going to talk about very quickly the moral philosophy and moral development. Kohlberg, if you're familiar with Kohlberg, he has three stages. Okay. Uh, he says that uh, character education is achieved through reflection and learning. And as you grow older, you know, you develop from pre-conventional stage to the conventional stage, the post-conventional stage. What's in quite uh, the, my gaming experiences, and, and yours as well, I'm sure, that when you encounter young players, what's good in a game, what's bad, is always me, me, me. And uh, in the early days of WoW, there's a lot of people who will level up. And the moment they level, they tell everybody how fast they have leveled. And you know, if, if you're tolerant enough, you say, grats, or you can say, good for you. you know, or they get, after a while, it gets tiring if they keep on boasting. Then later on, as they play together with the guild, the community within the, the, the game, right, uh, they, they, you find that they begin to advance goals of the group. So selfish play is frowned on. Your guild leader or guild members will say, you, know, you have to play for the group or the whole team. So you develop teamwork there. So later on, there are rules, the guilds, also have, the guilds have their own rules, and there are, there are conflicts that arises. So you have to, you know, these are real conflicts, you know. Real conflicts that happen in games. Two game characters can fight, but in real life, two people will not talk to each other because they fought in the game, because it's that real, you know, it can, that can happen. So the guild members will have to manage the conflict and maybe uh, heal the ruffle, you know, soothe the ruffle, ruffle feathers and heal the relationships. There's another uh, moral development uh, theories, uh, Ryan and Riconas, Riconas model. Uh, they say character develops in and through community. So it's a community that is important. We grow through membership, 
relationships, to roles to play, perspectives to consider, conflicts to resolve, commitments to fulfill, relationships to care about, responsibilities to juggle, that's a lot, right? And the social ma matrix in which we live and have our moral being, that's what they say. So if you play in an MMO, you know, and you have a guild, this is my guild taken several years ago, I do not know whether you can spot me, just to let you know, I'm here. Okay, and this is a guild after we have killed this, I can't remember the monster just so many years ago. We all pose for a photograph because we have a shared sense of achievement. We often do that. Every time we down the big boss or something like that, or monster, or he, you know, we all pose together. And this sense of community, shared excitement that you know, we have done something together, this t teamwork, it's something very precious to, to gamers. Right? Uh, that's another one they say. Through moral knowing, character, uh, character education is achieved through moral knowing, effect and action and in the game. This is what happened. The interaction with guild members, they learn what to do and what not to do while playing. They have strong commitment to the guild and uphold the values of the guild. And they have discussions and debates that go on, not just in the game, there are guild forums outside the websites and the, the relationships continue. They, they share birthdays, you know, they, they talk about problems in school, in life. They, they share real life. Some, sometimes guild, guild members have babies or get buried or things like that. And the guild understands and there's a lot of social support. In fact, there's one, uh, um, let me go back this, there's one story. Some years ago, there's one of our guild members had, a, a, had to undergo chemotherapy and she said she won't be playing. And everybody was inquiring when she came back. There's so much support. Everybody in the guild was asking how she was doing and giving encouragement. And she really felt loved not just in the real world, but also in the virtual world with all her friends from all over the world. Okay? Um, let me go on. Okay, so care ethics, nail nodding's model of care ethics. Modeling, right? Dialogue, practice, and confirmation. This is how we convey moral values and character education through these four, four ways that she mentions. So the guild members can act as role models. They help one another achieve their goals, establish culture of caring, as I mentioned just now, boost morale, and they become real life friends. I am still friends with my guild members that I met in WOW seven years ago. We get out of WOW, we get in back in a while, we get in and out, but we still communicate, we share recipes, and we talk about aging issues and how our fingers are getting a bit too old to play go in raids and things like that, okay? We still talk about these things. Real life issues, game issues, but real life issues as well. Uh, this is from Star Wars, the Old Republic. I, I stopped playing this because WoW came back. And uh, I'm gonna show this moral dilemma, okay? If you play Star Wars, you would know, uh, okay, uh, this is s slave. How to keep your slave in mind. Ouch! Give it a rest, will ya? I'm getting my fill of fun while I still can, slave. Uh, as now if this I'm is cute, supposed to be your character, back. okay? Word and he is, owns you the might become Lord Barriss's apprentice. Uh, nice work if you can get it. Barriss supposedly sent me an acolyte named Clemrel. Some whiny little cast off. But the deadbeat hasn't shown up. He's too dark. You know anything about him? You can't see I'm very not well. Clemrel's keeper. Uh, no, I suppose not. So, I hear you'll be relieving me of this Twi'lek. She's a pain in the neck. Ha! <laughs> Who's a pain in the neck? I'm the one wearing a shock collar. Huh. Consider that a going away present, Tweelik. Seems you might be useful for something after all. This bruiser is taking you into the tomb where we caught you. None of you can figure out how to activate the tomb statues to open the Forbidden Cavern, huh? You got some kind of business in that secret sick chamber, do you? Go, those Jayla, are the choices. I think she needs a little more juice. All right. Okay, just for a while. Um, you get to choose whether you shock her or you free her. So you have a choice. So you want to play aggressive, you get dark points, you shock her some more. And what, what about this character? I like this Twi'lek character. She has a lot of spunk. She's a slave. But she has a lot of resilience. She's not a wimpy, whiny slave. She has a lot of character that people can you know, look up to. Here he's being shocked, she's saying, enough already, she says. You know? And she has very witty rebuttals. And that's, that's a character for you. That's, that's a character to emulate. She's not, although she's a slave, she, she doesn't blame the circumstances. She bounces back from time to time. Uh, just play a little bit more. One more for the road. Okay, then. Oh. Doctor, oh. Doctor. Enough! Yes, enough, Make it. Take Okay, right. Uh, moral dilemmas through missions. In I like 
Star Wars, although it's not very popular now. I like the missions because the missions or the quests give you moral choices all the time. Here's one. Uh, I've got this guy called Overseer Tremel, and he's supposed to give me certain quests, and this is my mission, right, to deal with the prisoners. That's prisoner one, two, and three. So how, what do I do with them? I can hire the first one. I can hire her, free her or hire her, or execute her. I can, this one for this other guy, a Sith soldier, right, he made a mistake. Uh, do I execute him straight away or fight him? And then the third one, do I let him rot in jail or continue to torture him? Some, I know some players prefer to torture because they say, ah, this is only a game and you torture and you put all the electric currents and, and then you see the, just for the fun of it. But if you do this in a game and then you can talk about it, the important thing is for the community to discuss this and we talk about torture. In fact, in our, our I have a Facebook, we started a Facebook uh, forum on talking about this kind of issues and then no, I have a few members who are talking about torture. When is it right to torture? And then he went on to... Um, Guantanamo and whether torture is right if you have a loved one who's in trouble when is it okay when it's not okay and these are moral issues and all because we started talking about torture started from this game so it is a platform to launch uh, to, into moral discussions here's another one uh, this one okay this one is interesting because there are quite a number of NS men here okay uh, mission is mercy you meet this sergeant who discovers some medical supplies that have been stolen and uh, this this character this uh, she's a kata Okay, and she stole the medicine to help the refugees, but she claimed that the separatists stole it from her. So your your mission is to get back the medical supplies you, which you have, and after you recover the medicine, do you give it to her for her to distribute to the ref refugees, or do you give back to your sergeant? What will you choose? Th that's a choice. So my friend said he chose the sergeant. Why? Because he's national serviceman now. Ah must obey <laughs> orders, right? And some people say, no, no, uh, you, she has a, I, I didn't tell you this, but she has a little boy with her, and this little boy says uh, he's in pain, and she tells the little boy, sorry, I ran out of medical supplies. So out of empathy, you know, you feel sorry for the boy, you might want to give it to her. Then there's the argument, the argument goes on. If you give it to her, she can only distribute it to the small group of refugees. If you give it to the sergeant, he can coordinate the rescue mission, and he can distribute it more fairly. So what's your choice? Just for the fun of it, how many of you will give it to the woman? How many of you will give it to the sergeant? <laughs> A few more hands. More men say sergeant. <laughs> right? I think more ladies will feel sorry for the little girl, I mean for the little kid over there. So this interesting choice, it is a platform for discussion and debate. There's no right and wrong, but your choices, although the game gives you dark points and light points, you can still debate on what's right and wrong about the action. Okay, uh, this is very, I, I don't mean you to read everything. This is from my friend who put, put it up on, on, the, on my Facebook page about this quest. This is the same quest. And from there, there are several things that teachers can use. He's a, he's a teacher. He can say we can talk about wars in history and students can see the refugees you know, and what it means to, to, to be involved in a war, how to take sides, exercise in perspective taking, allocating priorities, making tough decisions, and justice in your own hand. He has this whole discussion. So which I thought I'd just copy and paste over for you to see, but I don't mean you to read everything, it's just too long. But just to, to, to emphasize a point that these games can bring out a lot of debate and discussion. Okay, World of Warcraft. Uh, do you, are you familiar with Leroy? <laughs> okay, for those of you who are not, this is a classic. Now what happens at the beginning? Okay guys, He's uh, giving these eggs have given us a lot of trouble in the past. Uh, does anybody need Anything off this guy, or can we bypass him? Uh, I think Leroy needs. I'm just going to stop here because what's happening is yeah, the, the raid leader is explaining to the group how to tackle the particular quest here. All right, it's a complicated quest. I think there are 10 members, and everybody got their roles what to do, what not to do. In the room, adjoining room, there are lots of dragon eggs. If you fall into these eggs, you'll be packed to death by the hatchling. Terrible way to die. My character died that way once. Right, and so you have to avoid that. So he's telling them what to do, avoid the eggs. Meanwhile, Leroy was not in that group. So here, he, he, for about three minutes or so, you have the guild leader painstakingly explaining what to do and what not to do. And then here comes Leroy. Let me advance it further. Uh, when my shout's done, uh, I'll need Anthony to come in and drop his shout too, uh, so we can keep him scattered, not to fight too many. Um, when his is done, Bass, of course, will need to run in and do the same thing. Uh, we're going to need divine intervention on our mages uh, so they can uh, AE 
uh, so we can, of course, get them down. And we should be able to pull it off this time. Number crunch real quick. Uh, yeah, give me a sec. I'm coming up with 32.33, repeating, of course, percentage of survival. Oh, that's a lot better than we usually do. Uh, All right, thumbs up. Ready, guys? Let's or? do this. Leroy! And there he goes. <laughs> Before everybody's ready, he rushes in. He calls all of them to die. All the effort in, in, in preparation, all the detailed instructions given, all gone. Gone. Okay, so the whole game lost. And this is a classic. Okay, uh, it's a classic because we all laugh at it. But can you imagine that if you are in that group, how angry you would be? You'll be so angry. You'll be so fast. I, I'm not going to show because afterwards there'll be plenty of expletives. Right? <laughs> And you're thinking, you know, what not to do in the red. And if you are part of that, this is a great opportunity for anger management. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great opportunity for the guild leader to say, cool it. And in fact, that happened to me. I was mentioned, I just mentioned it to you just now. And my guild leader, actually, uh, when I fell into the hatchling and everybody was scolding me, you know, I was silly enough to do that. What he did was he jumped in and died with me. And he escorted me back to the scene. And he says, how many of you... I've been noobs before, and and the girl was the other members were silent. Oh, they, they have been there before. They have been noobs, you know. They were all new and silly players before, and he he felt he restored my confidence, and I I, I felt like oh dear, the, the, I have no more face to continue playing. I'm going to silently quit and say sorry. I have to AFK and uh, adjourn and disappear because I was so ashamed of myself. But my girl leader said no, look, no, everybody makes mistakes. Let's start all over again. And so that, that kind of leadership, so another value that we, we learn, the leadership, how to communicate and how to make things better. This one is all about ganking. And yeah. This is all music here. And this guy tells you very proudly on YouTube how he gangs people who, who are his victims. Ranking is explained that I think it's a form of cyberbullying. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you get the idea. He is very proudly telling people how he gang those who are weak. So when, when after they kill a mob, after their health is low, that he comes in and he attacks them, and they cannot fight back because their health is low. Okay. So if you are that victim, what do you do? You can shout. I, I know what people are. I know some of my students would like to do. They call their guild members and they form a gang, and then they can gang him instead in return. And you can actually, and if he calls his gang, you can start a gang war right there. <laughs> and, but that is a good opportunity for someone who is calm and say, okay, let's move, quit, move to another character, stop playing, you know, don't, like, don't be a victim. How not to be a victim is a tremendous opportunity there to tell kids how not to be a victim, how to react to him. You know, you can't talk to him because he's hot, now. you can't, can't really message him because there's no communication. And if you're alliance and he's hot, you don't communicate. But there are other ways where you can just quit and do things to manage your anger. You'll be very angry and frustrated there. So that's one opportunity. And this is a summary. What do you learn in raids? When you, I, I like to go raiding, but normally the raids in World of Warcraft take very long hours and usually quite late in the night. And I don't do that often anymore because uh, my research projects are you know, quite uh, heavy. So when you're in a raid, you've got to manage frustrations that I've shown you, all the wipes, wipes when you're totally wiped out and you die, you've got to spend money repairing and then come back again. You have to be patient with poor, poor players. You've got to accept uh, one another's view. When everybody wipes, there's a lot of uh, thinking going on, decision making, problem solving, because you've got to analyze why you failed, wh whose fault was it, and when you re realize it's whose fault was it because the healer wasn't doing the job properly or something. There's a, there's a lot of opportunities to blame someone. And at the same time, there's also opportunities to understand from another person's perspective, right? Uh, understanding self and other team members, being tactful in communicating with others. When you prepare for a raid, you just don't go, don't go for the raid on the, on the day itself. Uh, several days before, when 
as a healer, I got to go and collect herbs to make healing potions. And that will take several days of preparation. I can't go to a raid without healing potions. If I don't I run out of healing potions, I'm not being very responsible. Okay? So I got to be punctual. I got to trust everybody to do their part. So there's trusting that the, the tank has to trust the healer to heal him. You see your health going down, down, down. You say, I'm going to be healed, but you cannot heal yourself, so you have to trust. There's a lot of you have, uh, trust with the team members to do their part. You have to put guild members' needs before yourself. Uh, you not boast how much, you know, you should not boast how much you have contributed or how high your damage per second is. You know, you'll be not be very popular with the guild. And uh, not giving up when defeated, but trying again. So these are all the values that I inherit in a, in a, in a raid. So I would love to see a teacher reading, leading a raid with all the kids in a character education class. <laughs> then you can have, you know, and it, it's not planned, and you can have all the spontaneous actions and you can react to them accordingly, you see. Okay, there are lots of games in Moral Dilemmas now, and uh, I hope to see more games in Moral Dilemmas, games that provoke decision making and character building. This is my, my last slide. These are two books that uh, I, I found. I bought one of them now. It's not, not cheap, <laughs> but it's, it's good. Ethics and game design, and designing games for ethics, okay? Um, so what do I want to see if I peer into the crystal ball? In the future, I'd like to see more players having moral discussions with their peers, more teachers presenting moral dilemmas in commercial games, not, uh, not because the kids are really in, into commercial games. So bring the commercial games to class. We were talking about how to bring games to teachers. We we're trying to get teachers into the game world. It, I'd like to see more parents actively playing with the kids playing the games themselves and encouraging these discussions and through the discussions and moral dilemma, hopefully we get some values internalized. That's all I have for you today. Thank you.